What's cracking, yo? Welcome back to Boo TV. Appreciate you for stopping in. Like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, stay notified, and let's get into the topic for today. All right. I want to give a shout out to some of our viewers and subscribers that recommended this video for me to watch and react to. Making the case, Larry Bird. Um, shout out to Hank Moore, Ronald Sifala, and my boy Doug. Forgive me if I miss anybody else that recommended this video, but shout out to you guys as well. Um, I don't have Larry Bird as my GOAT, just a little bit of context. I think Michael Jordan is the greatest of all time, my personal opinion, but I feel like players like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Wilt Chamberlain, Larry Bird, just to name a few, all have good arguments on why they could be the greatest of all time as well. So I'm interested in reacting and watching this video to see the argument for Larry Legend. Basketball is special. The size of the court and the lack of pads or helmets give fans the most intimate experience of a team sport that exists. And because of the different styles that basketball allows for, players develop their own distinct identities and signature styles through their creativity, flair, Pistol. and athleticism. DeAndre Jordan, CP. And although no player succeeds alone, the Kawhi scoring Leonard. volume and two-way nature of the sport give individual stars a nearly unprecedented amount of control over the flow and outcome of a game. For this reason, players are constantly compared to their peers and to the legends of the past in order to answer the most hotly contested question in the sport. Sure. Who's the greatest to ever do it? For many, the question is redundant. They believe in only one right answer, their answer. Others might have their own personal stance, but acknowledge one or two alternatives. But I believe that there's much more nuance to the question of greatness and more answers to it than you might think. I agree. On my count, there are eight players in NBA history that have a substantial claim as the GOAT. It's a subjective thing, though. I can't give you a definitive answer. All I can do is make the argument. So today, I'll be making the case for Larry Bird as the greatest basketball player of all time. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. I'm curious to see, like, I know some angles I would look at, but I, I want to see his angles here. When it comes to basketball, Larry Bird is the smartest, clutchest player to ever play the game. Now, if you don't think that Larry Bird is the greatest basketball player of all time, you probably hate that I just said that. Those are the kind of talking head sport cliches that surely impact the game, but are impossible to empirically measure. Normally, I'd agree with you, but I think that when you talk about Larry Bird, you see those intangibles become real, palpable results. I wouldn't have said it if I didn't believe it. When Larry Bird was drafted by the Boston Celtics in 1978, the NBA needed saving. Attendance was in the toilet, the league had few marketable stars, cocaine addiction had several players in its grasp, and most damning of all, playoff games were being tape delayed. Playoff games at the highest level of basketball were being put in the back seat for black and white movies and network reruns. Yeah. But rather than join the Celtics after being taken third overall, Larry Bird decided to return for his final year at Indiana State, a decision that would prove to be one of the most important in the history of the sport. Bird's final year saw the Sycamores tear through college basketball, going 33-0 <laughs> before the national championship game. Bird, already claimed by the NBA's most historic and prestigious franchise, had established himself as the generational talent who would inherit the mantle of pro basketball. Indiana State's opponent in the national championship was Michigan State, captained by the immortal Irvin Magic Johnson. Mm. The Sycamores lost the championship to the more talented Spartans in the highest rated game in the history of basketball at any level still to this day. The stage had been set. The next decade of basketball would be defined by the rivalry between the white hick from French Lick and his Boston Celtics and the Black Magic and his Showtime Lakers. Black the Magic. The rivalry between Bird and Johnson is entwined into the fabric of the NBA and is worthy of a hundred documentaries. In this video though, we're gonna be looking at Bird's claim of supremacy. Here's Bird's basketball resume. His three championships come with perhaps the highest collective degree of difficulty of any player's championships. His three MVPs came consecutively, making him only the third player to accomplish the feat, along with Bill Russell and Wilt Chamberlain. His two finals MVPs are misleading. He was absolutely the best player on the 81 Celtics, but he was only a sophomore, and his 15 points per game in the finals gave the media an excuse to exact a little vengeance on a legendarily difficult interview. 
His all-star and first-team selections also come with the caveat that Bird only played for 13 seasons and yes. missed all but six games of the 89 season following surgeries on both feet. Yes, double Achilles. I can hear you already. A 13-year career. And this guy is supposed to be the GOAT? What color of paint are you huffing, Clayton? Green. Obviously. But hear me out. Yeah, Bird's career lasted about two-thirds as long as it should have. But what he did in that time was so impressive and so substantial that every basketball fan acknowledges that he's in the conversation as the greatest ever. Doesn't it? I totally agree with that. I'm not one of these guys that says, oh, because this player played eight to ten more years, that that necessarily makes their career better, makes them better. Um, if you played 13 careers and you were highly successful in your 13 careers, and if you played 13 years and you were highly successful in those 13 years and played at a prime level, that speaks for itself and what you were able to do in that small amount of time. You look at a player like Larry Bird or you look at a player like Michael Jordan uh, with his tenure with the Bulls, what he was able to do in that amount of time, six championships, you know, among everything else. And you got a players that played 20 years and still haven't been able to match Michael Jordan's accolades, right? It's something, it's something I, I like to think about. Let's continue. It matter that those 13 years saved professional basketball, yes. delivered a disproportionate amount of memorable moments, yes. defined the golden age of the league, and yes. produced a career by which Ooh. all other forwards, before or since, are measured? Bird squeezed every drop of talent out in those 13 years and made it seem more like 30. Yeah. He didn't just leave his fingerprints on the game. He left so much of his DNA. Jesus, that pass. That I love that pass. Cigarette afterwards. There's something to be said about the candle that lasts half as long but burns twice as bright. Those three MVP years stack up with any other run by any other player. I will put an A plus Larry Bird season up against anyone's. What Fair does enough. an A plus Larry Bird season look like? A full box score, a blowout, pass. Win, a nearly undefeated record at home and a play style that could only be described one way, white. Larry Bird isn't just a white basketball player, he's the white basketball the player. The white basketball to player. To describe Larry Bird's game is to thumb through the hoops dictionary and pick out every cliche about white players. Unathletic, great shooter, good fundamentals, the whole thing. The archetype of a white basketball player is Larry Bird, with one exception. He had an unparalleled understanding of the game of basketball, both as a physical contest and as a mental competition. His basketball IQ infected everything he did and catapulted his career into legend. Bird was a complete player. Jerry West called him nearly as perfect as you can get. He was the league's first great marksman. He could contort his body to shoot from anywhere on the court, regardless of the level of defense. Yes. He pioneered the art of the Dagger 3 and was the founding member of the 50-40-90 club. Yes, At he six was. At 6'9", Bird's understanding of angles and coordination led to a higher rebounding average than Patrick Ewing, and it made him an impressively adept finisher in his younger years. 86, Bird dropped 47 points on the Blazers, playing the majority of the game left-handed. His lack of quick lateral movement meant that Bird didn't do much when it came to slapping the floor and picking up the opposing point guard, but his size and omniscience gave him the ability to body similarly sized players, read defenses like a free safety, and pick off passing lanes with ease. His passing was transcendent, and I'll highlight it later. Yes. And of course you need to know that Larry Bird was a tough M effort. He had a superhuman motor and dove for loose balls like a beagle at the park. He was a willing participant in his share of fights, often precipitated by his league-renowned trash talk. <laughs> I told Robert Reedy to stay there. He should have stayed in preaching. <laughs> that was funny. He had 50 points. I was guarding in my rookie year. He looked at me and he goes, you can't stop me. And I looked at him and I said, gosh, boy, you're, you're so confident. Keep Clyde the Glide Drexler. The coach took me out the game. He walks by and he's laughing at me. <laughs> he was a basketball genius. He'd be a step ahead, uh, a thought ahead, uh, play the game like a chess game. I'd much rather guard Michael Jordan than Larry Bird because mm. you have to play. Okay, James. As a thinker when you're playing him, you have all to get right, James. inside his mind. If you put all of us in a room, you know, Magic, Jordan, myself, and Bird, Bird probably be the guy who walks out of the room at the end of the day. Did you notice something? I hear you. I'm not. I'm not saying that that can't be an accurate statement. In his opinion but we all know how much 
Isaiah Thomas hates Michael Jordan. I don't know when that hatred started. I don't know if he hated him back during the time of this interview, whenever that was. But, oh no, it all started with the whole Dream Team situation. I don't know when this interview was, but I got to take what Isaiah Thomas says with a grain of salt when Michael Jordan is involved. Something during those testimonies? Those are some of the best basketball players of all time, and they all sing Bird's praises like they were former assassins who had to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with John Wick, and they're just happy to be alive. Bird mm. excelled during one of the most talent-rich periods in league history. Yes, he did. The abridged list of his basketball rivals goes like this. Dr. J and Moses Malone on the Philadelphia 76ers, Sidney Moncrief on the Milwaukee Bucks, Isaiah Thomas, Bill Lambeer, and the Bad Boy Pistons, Dominique Wilkins on the Atlanta Hawks, Bernard King on the New York Knicks, Bernard King, Michael Jordan on the Chicago Bulls, Hakeem Olajuwon and Ralph Sampson on the Houston Rockets, and of course, Magic Johnson, James Worthy, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar on the Los Angeles Lakers. All right, there's no point avoiding it any longer. We have to look at Magic versus Larry. If you have Magic over Larry, it's because he has five rings to Larry's three, had right. a peak that lasted about two or three years longer than Larry's, and had a two-in-one record against Bird Celtics in the finals. Perfectly legitimate, completely respectable arguments. But in the interest of making Bird's case, allow me to retort. For nearly the entire decade of the 1980s, the Eastern Conference was irrefutably the more competitive conference between the two. True. Considering the competition, for Bird to have made five finals appearances is just as impressive as Magic's not. I want to, I always bring that up when comparing players past and present is what was your conference like? What kind of competition were you facing more on a daily basis? Because, you know, in the Western Conference, let's just use that for an example, you'll play Western Conference teams usually twice as many times as an Eastern Conference team, right? Back in the day, the, the teams have expanded, but like, for example, when I would compare Kobe to LeBron, I was like, Kobe had to make it through that beast of the Western Conference. Kobe had to play at San Antonio Spurs four times a year versus LeBron only had to play him two times a year. You know what I'm saying? That, that Having to play those Western Conference teams four times in a season, three to four times, it's brutal. Continue. As for the head-to-head -head record responsible for Magic's two extra titles, he had more help. Seriously, the Celtics Big Three and the Lakers Big Three get compared all the time historically as if they were of equal caliber, but weren't Magic's accomplices just a step above Bird's? No disrespect at all to Kevin McHale and Robert Parrish, but Kareem was the alpha dog on the 71 bucks and was the best player for at least two of the Lakers' five titles. Oh, that's Sky Hook. Oh my God. James Worthy was the number one pick out of UNC after winning a championship as the best player on a team that had Michael Jordan on it. Throw in the fact that Magic got to be coached by Pat Riley, one of the most brilliant minds in basketball history, and you could say that the Magic Bird argument comes down to one thing, luck. So if their careers come down to luck, the question just becomes who you would rather take. Now, I'm not making this video to tell you why you shouldn't take Magic. I'm making this video to tell you why you should take Bird. Not just over Magic, but over everybody. One thing that helps him is the fact that his play would translate perfectly into the league today. A six foot nine sharp shooting forward with yes. eyes in the back of his head yes. who averaged double digit rebounds in an era against Moses and Lambeer. He'd gobble up boards as a power forward. He'd be an offensive mismatch against everybody as a small ball center, and his off-ball skills and passing would pair perfectly with the flow of today's game. I'm not saying that Magic couldn't have adapted his game to the current NBA, as most players in the current NBA has, but just dropping them down as they were, dropping them then as they were, Bird would dominate today's NBA. Like he said, shooter, rebounder, ball handler. Come on, man. He'd light it up, man. Bird would average like, in this NBA, man, Bird probably averaged like 30, 37, 38, 12, 13 rebounds. Crazy. Add in his competitive mania and three generations worth of medical advancements, and we're talking about a player who could have stuck around so long they would have True. had to rename the league. True. As you've been watching these clips of Bird, I would hope that you would notice something. He always knows where everybody is. Watching Bird play basketball is like watching those monsters from a quiet place that know where you are if you make any noise <laughs> at all. Bird had a level of clairvoyance that bordered on the unnatural. In 85, he ended up one steal away from a quadruple double after playing just the first three quarters. His passing was famously... What? 
I didn't know that. One value away from a quadruple double through three quarters? Oh my God. Wow. Infectious and helps transform the Celtics of the 80s into an ideal that basketball teams at all levels are still shown tape of. They moved the ball with precision and intent, always looking for better shots and determined to get the entire team involved in the effort. That fact is almost entirely attributable to Bird and his wizardry with the ball. This acumen also helped Bird become the only player with a GOAT claim to transition successfully into other basketball roles after his playing career. In his three years as the head coach of the Pacers, Bird won a Coach of the Year award, coached the Pacers to their first and Eastern only Conference finals, finals. Appearance, and gave Michael Jordan as much trouble as he'd ever gotten yeah. in his career in the 98 Eastern Conference Finals. Dude, I remember those 98 Eastern Conference Finals like it was yesterday. We were on vacation in Carolina, North Carolina. Bird's coaching was on point and and Reggie Miller was giving me goddamn heart attacks. After moving into a front office role for Indiana, he won Executive of the Year in 2012, becoming the only person to have an MVP, Coach of the Year, and Executive of the Year award. On the court or off of it, inside and out, Larry Bird sees basketball as only he can. He's a mastermind. That intelligence also lent itself to Bird's defining skill, making the big plays. Remember, NBA players get paid to win games. James Harden is getting paid nearly $40 million this year because he's supposed to help the Rockets win games. Victory can be achieved in a lot of ways, and the win column doesn't care how it happens. As Mark Sinclair once said, It don't matter if you win by an inch or a mile. Winning's winning. But when your team is down one in a crucial playoff game with eight seconds left and you need to hit Black a shot Mamba. to stay in the series and keep your season alive, that's where players really separate themselves and earn their money. Love it or hate it, it's the players that come through in the big moments that live forever in our memories. Some players, for whatever reason, were never able to do it consistently. Some players were truly outstanding at it. Larry Bird was the best at it. I love that celebration. I'm not going to give you the stats about his field goal shooting under two minutes with a score that's this close or tell you who has the most buzzer beaters or any of that. Take that for data. I'm just going to show you clutch moments in clutch situations. 1985 against the Blazers. Bird drops 48 points, including this. Down one with two seconds left. Inbound pass to double team and Bird. Larry, fake, fall away. Stand by. I like what he said about, I'm not going to sit here and throw all these clutch numbers and clutch stats. It pisses me off sometimes when people do that because they like to skew how much time is left on the clock to fit a certain player's argument, right? For example, they say clutch is defined by being down or tied in a game. You have the final shot with, you know, four seconds or, or less or left four seconds or, God, I can't talk, four seconds or or less left on the clock right now it says okay player a has 10 is 10 out of 10 with four seconds left on the clock right but if you change that clock now let's just say with more time for whatever reason he shoots an abysmal percentage between four to seven seconds or more more or less five to seven seconds and then his clutch percentage or his clutch value is now completely different. So I don't really get into that. I know what I saw from these players. I know what I saw. Screw attaching a number to it, a value to it. All right! 1985 against the Hawks. Bird sets the Celtics scoring record with 60 points with shots like these. They open the right side. Bird the fall away. Mm, that, was, that was a saucy fadeaway. 1986 against the Rockets. Not all of Bird's clutch moments were singular. The bigger the moment, the bigger his performance. In Game 6 of the 1986 NBA Finals, that is. Bird clinches the championship with a triple-double in what he calls the best game he ever played. Two on the shot clock, Bird Fade. 1987 against the Washington Bullets. Bird hits one shot to tie it before it's waved off because of a timeout. Hits another shot to tie it up for real. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine that. 
the, off the left foot. Off the and left foot. And then in foot. double overtime, down one, he does this. Off the, off the left foot again. For three years, from 1986 to 1988, the three-point contest knew no other champion but Larry Bird. He's still gonna drop one here quickly, 14. This is a tie. Dude, the with the warm-up shirt on. Oh. Killing 1987, him. Eastern Conference Finals, Game 5. Tie Imagine just going to a three-point contest, not even stripping down into your jersey. It's just like, I'm going to keep my warm-up jacket on. Short sleeve or long sleeve, roll them up. It doesn't matter. I'm just going to come in fresh out of bed, just drink a cup of coffee, still still trying to wake up with my jacket on. I'm going to just win the three-point contest. My God, Larry Legend. My God. Tied at two games apiece against the Bad Boy Pistons, this enormous game would put the winner one game away from the NBA Finals. The Pistons are up one with seconds remaining. The ball goes out of bounds off the Celtics. Isaiah Thomas just needs to inbound the ball to win the game. Now that's a steal by Dude, his, to be able to stay in bounds. There are truly too many big games and big moments for me to go through without this ending up as a documentary. But that all leads me to this, what I really want to talk about. 1987, NBA Finals, Game 4 against the Lakers. LA is up two games to one, and the Celtics need to win to tie the series and stay alive. Bird hits a three with 12 seconds left to go up by two. Dude, that baseline is money. Kareem comes down and gets fouled with eight seconds left. He makes the first. but misses the second. LA ends up with the ball with seven seconds left, down one point. In the low post, being guarded by Dennis Johnson. Byron Scott is in the ball game now. Magic hits this, the baby sky. Yep, the baby sky. Hook shot, scores with two. Two seconds left, down one. Dennis Johnson on the inbound. Good move by Larry Legend. What do you think happens? <laughs> I bet it wasn't that. When I paused the tape and the ball was hanging in the air, you thought it was going in. I knew it was going. I knew it wasn't going, it was in. going in. Magic thought it Only was going in. Only because I've seen it before. I've seen this game before, and I still think it's going to go in. But it didn't. Pat Riley said it himself. We got lucky. And that a missed shot in the NBA Finals is why he's the clutchest. Because after he makes the big plays, has the big games, hits the big shots, time and time again, you expect him to hit every shot, to win every game. Right. And in those fleeting moments when he doesn't, when he looks like a mere human, it's your surprise. When he looks like everyone else who tries to do what he does, yeah. you just can't believe it. Yeah. That's what Larry Bird did. Yeah. He made the big plays so often, you thought he was going to make them every, every time. time. Yeah. Facts. He helped turn basketball into a global phenomenon paving the way for every Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, or LeBron James who comes through our lives. Sure. He played basketball in its purest form and captained a team that is consistently ranked among the greatest of all time. He has the second highest win percentage in the history of the NBA, behind Magic by less than one half of 1%, about 10 games. He was the complete package, a player with no holes in his game whatsoever. They called him Basketball Jesus, he didn't get that name without doing something extraordinary. He saved basketball, and he did it by playing it better than anyone else. Here's Magic at Bird's retirement in 1993. Larry Bird said that there will be another Larry Bird one day. And Larry, no, there will never, ever, ever be another Larry Bird to uh, the greatest basketball player ever but more important a friend forever am I about to cry oh my god that was deep am I about to cry oh my god no um Hey, man, making the case for Larry. There is a strong, like I said at the beginning of the video, there, there is a case for a lot of these players. There is a case. And I, I wouldn't sit up here and have a full-blown argument with anybody if they wanted Larry as their greatest of all time. And especially when you consider 
the the impact he had on the NBA along with Magic Johnson and what they did for the league when it was at its lowest point and looking like it was going to get pushed into the 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 shadows of the nether realms like he pumped life into this sport and you know had bird not emerged you know and magic with him who knows where the nba would be right now maybe it would have just dissolved and disappeared so far down into the abyss that it never came back up they literally gave life to this entire league and kept it moving forward. Paved the way for everybody else, not just through their playing style, learning from them, but literally providing a game to play and a product where consumers are willing to spend their time and money to support it and to be entertained. That, that cannot go without being mentioned. It cannot. It cannot. It's directly related to basketball. No question. No question about it. Listen, it is a very compelling argument for Larry Bird. No question about it. Mike's, Mike's still my GOAT. MJ's still my GOAT. No question. But this is, this is a strong argument for Larry Legend, man. You know, for his entire career, even battling through these crazy ass injuries, you know, he still, even when he was not himself, even when he was a shell of himself, he was still an all star. It's crazy to think about. And like he said, like I said earlier, probably put him right now in today's NBA. He will light this league up. Kidding me? Larry Legend. Put some respect on his name. Let me know who you think the greatest of all time is. I would love to hear your opinion. Who is your GOAT? Who is your master? Your greatest of all time player? Who is it? I would love to hear your opinion. Like, comment, subscribe, hit that bell. And if you have any recommendations for me for content and or reaction videos, let me know in the comment section. I'll be happy to check it out. Take care and I'll catch you on the next one. We out, baby.